to welcome you uh, to the eighth in our series of Institute Encounters. Uh, and today um, we have, uh, very happily, um, a distinguished philosopher of science, uh, Dr. Susan Hack. Uh, Dr. Hack is distinguished professor in the humanities uh, at the University of Miami and Cooper Senior Scholar of Arts and Letters there as well. And she has written about a wide range of topics in epistemology, in the philosophy of science, uh, and indeed uh, in the philosophy of and relationship of uh, law and science. And I think that's what I'd, I'd like to sort of begin talking to you about uh, this morning. Um, you know, you, you think of law and you think of science. Um, and in both cases, uh, there's this notion of rules, of, of, of rules that are adhered to, and they're both called laws, actually. Uh, we have laws in jurisprudence, and we have laws uh, in, in science. Um, uh, is, uh, does that really get at something that um, distinguishes both of them? Um, uh, or is it uh, a kind of borrowing of language that perhaps obscures um, a, a, a real and important difference to, to keep in mind? Um, I think it's closer to the latter. Um, probably, if, if one were to trace the history of the concept of the law, of a natural law, you might very well find that it had connections. The, the idea is that these are God's laws as opposed to our laws. Mm -hmm. But I think these are really two quite importantly different senses of the word. So in, in one case you would say it's a convention, and in the other case... I would say in one case it's entirely man-made, mm -hmm. and in the other it's not man-made. Well, it's barely man-made at all. <laughs> not that, okay, maybe there are synthetic substances about which there are laws, and maybe you want to say those laws are man-made, but this would be a tiny area of the whole story. Um, well, uh, <coughs> there, there are people, of course, who continue to argue um, that the notion of natural law mm -hmm. uh, is a, um, a, 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 a fundamental way of, of understanding how we mm -hmm. come to kind of regulate our lives, one, mm -hmm. one or the other. Um, one can argue that, I suppose, theologically. One might conceivably also argue that with respect to um, the kinds of evolved minds that we have, uh, which perhaps uh, see certain kinds of normative mm -hmm. regularities as obligatory, no matter what mm -hmm. sort of culture mm -hmm. we're brought up in. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that the notion of, of, of natural law is also a, a kind of uh, misleading uh, or, or, or a, uh, an error of some sort in, in, in understanding the way things are organized? Um, okay, well... Okay, the natural law theory and jurisprudence is still defended today um, by some very able people. John Finnis, for example, for whom I have a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's mistaken. Uh, uh, I guess one of the things I'm impressed by is the sheer variety of legal systems how extraordinarily different they have been in the past from what they are now, how extraordinarily different they are in other parts of the world mm -hmm. than they are here. And this confirms my understanding that legal systems are human creations. Um, I mean, it, we, we, were, we were talking in... And remember in the hotel, you're reading USA Today, and on the front page is oh, a band of dogs. Oh, don't shame me in front of our I'm viewers sorry. here. By <laughs> it was the only newspaper available. <laughs> <Thank> okay. <laughs> he was, as I would do, reading the only reading material available, namely USA Today. On the front is Amanda Knox. And I can still remember okay, so my more. sense of shock. And my student was even stronger, of course, because they're deeply committed to the US legal system. It will be their lives if they're lucky. And the idea that you can appeal an acquittal was a shock to me and a severe shock to them. They're still trying to get their heads around it. I'm still trying to understand what the transnational complications might be. 
so so there's clearly a lot of variety and mm -hmm. and some sometimes surprising and disconcerting from mm -hmm. our perspective mm -hmm. uh, variety in legal systems but but couldn't you say that I mean there are certain types of norms governing behavior which certainly influence law uh, like the the notion of the golden rule of doing to others as they would do to you isn't that virtually universal um, how would I know Okay, look, uh, I mean, I can't even begin to count the number of legal systems that there have been. Uh -huh. Indeed, it's very difficult to individuate. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, do you count the English legal system as one? Does that include the pre-jury trial stage when they're using oath and ordeal? Mm -hmm. right? um, how could I possibly say? I don't, okay. I, I don't know anybody in the world knows this. Uh, well, what then? what then is the relationship between science, which mm -hmm. is trying to de determine what those invariant regularities are that, that organize nature, mm -hmm. uh, and the study of law, which is dealing with this vast, um, very plastic uh, mm -hmm. complexity of rules and, and procedures. Okay, well, there are many such, that's the first thing. Um, if you're talking only about this country, um, though I think everything I will say will probably cover, until the last minute, uh, major Western legal systems. Um, you will have the legal system getting involved with the sciences in the form of regulating potentially dangerous scientific work. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, when they first started doing recombinant DNA work in Cambridge, Mass., there was hefty regulation because they were afraid of what might escape from the laboratory. Um, look, you see, I'm doing this Dunscotus thing, right? <laughs> uh, there's... Uh, the law sometimes gets involved when there is scientific fraud, um, specifically when there's federal money involved, for example. Um, there's a, a notorious case, the case of Eric Pullman. Um, he had taken large sums of federal grant money, um, allegedly for research on menopause and obesity. It turned out that the research was fraudulent, and he actually not only paid a hefty fine, but went to prison for a year. Okay. Uh, then there are any number of interesting cases where science and the law come into conflict. Um, one, one example would be in the class of what's called cultural heritage cases. I don't know if you've, have you heard of Kennewick Man? Um, but nine, of nine, readers may. Okay, 9,000 year old skeleton found in Kennewick, Washington. Initially thought to be the victim of a recent homicide. Then discovered to have a stone arrow point in its hip. Well, that's not a recent homicide. That's something very, very old, turns out to be 9,000 years old. <clears throat> Scientists, of course, and the physical anthropologists were just dying to get their hands on a piece of this skeleton, because with mitochondrial DNA, you could tell a lot about its ethnicity and who it was most closely related to. And from there, you could begin to understand how this country got populated in the first instance. Okay, they were very fascinating. But... Uh, there's there's a, a law called NAGPRA, which is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, which requires that artifacts or remains of ancestors of current Native American tribes be returned to the tribes for, in the case of the skeleton, decent burial. Now, you, you can certainly understand the motivation. You don't want your grandma's skeleton on display at a roadside stall in Arizona. This would just be... You, you see what I mean. Um, that was a long, long-running piece of litigation. went on for a decade or so before the scientists actually got their opportunity to do their stuff. Then there's a whole raft of cases of relative much interest to me about constitutional cases about the teaching of evolution in public high schools, um, <clears throat> which, as you may know, was at one time 
a crime in some states. Um, has for it has been for a long time uh, ruled unconstitutional to deem it a crime to do this. Um, but there has been pressure for a very, very long time for something like equal time for creation science or now for intelligent design theory. And there are very, very tricky issues about what constitutes science and what's allowed in science classes come up there. That wasn't, none of these were where I first came. Um, where I first came in was with respect to the use of scientific evidence in the court, uh, which is, I assume, everybody realizes is now more or less ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the, the, the two main things that come to mind, though, if, if you go on the internet and look up, if you're looking for an expert to testify in, uh, your, on your behalf in your case, you can find literally thousands of specialists offering their services. But the two that come immediately to mind, of course, are the use of DNA testimony in criminal cases and the use of epidemiological evidence in toxic tort cases, where one of the issues is whether this exposure actually caused the injury. Um, and that actually was where I came in um, it's where much of my teaching in the law school is. It's uh, actually the subject of a book I'm just mm -hmm. working on, mainly at the moment I'm fixing the footnotes, which is very dull, but the book itself I hope won't be dull, about the relation between law and science in that respect, the role of scientific testimony, how it's controlled in the US courtroom, what the law is about it, how that law developed, what the rationale is for it, whether and when it's a good rationale. That mm -hmm. question. So the law will determine who is appropriately thought of as, a, as an okay. authority, a scientific authority? Uh, what, what, yeah. are the, what are the issues that, okay, that are arise? Issues? Okay. Uh, now we, we have to be careful because okay, I, can, I, can, I will describe the issues as they arise in a common law system. The issues are look different in a civil law system. Okay, so they look somewhat different to a Spanish scholar or a French mm -hmm. scholar mm -hmm. or a, a Colombian scholar. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there are some underlying commonalities, but the legal structure is very different. So, in a common law system where uh, you have juries charged with determining what the facts of the case are, there's a distinction between admissibility, which is what evidence may be presented to the jury, and weight, which is, if it's presented, how far it goes towards proving some fact mm -hmm. at issue. Mm -hmm. You understand? And much of the very interesting legal history in the US system about this is to do with what the standard of admissibility of a, an expert witness is and what kinds of experts that allows and whether it cuts out whole classes or simply individuals mm -hmm. in some in mm -hmm. some way. Uh, that's a long and complicated history. It, it really starts in its modern form in 1923 with a case which still determines the law in a number of states, including Florida, Pennsylvania, California, New York, and proceeds from there in a, in a way that's still ongoing. Decisions are still being made which affect what testimony is admissible. Well, what is the, um, okay. what, what is the predominant rule? Okay, there are two, two predominant rules. Mm -hmm. um, one of the kind of interesting questions is how much difference it really makes mm -hmm. if you have. Uh, I'll go, I'll start with the 1923 one on the grounds it's easier chronologically. Okay. Uh, this is called the Fry Rule. It's named after a case, Fry versus United States. Criminal case. Mr. Fry was accused of murdering a doctor and he confessed. Um, I don't know if this is true, but folklore says 
he confessed because he thought he would get half the reward if he did. <laughs> um, I don't know if this is true, but it's a good story. Um, no doubt that explains its shelf life, it's still kicking around. Um, then he withdrew the confession, and his attorney had him take a then completely new lie detector test. It wasn't a polygraph in the modern sense, it was simply um, a blood pressure test to determine how labile your blood pressure was under questioning. And he passed. So of course his attorney wanted to get this evidence admitted in court. But the court ruled that it was inadmissible and the principle that it gave in a very, very short ruling, it's only a page and a half, no citation, uh, because it was a completely new idea. We control the content of what mm -hmm. you can say. Mm -hmm. And it was that the principle on which the testimony was based should be sufficiently established to be generally accepted in the field to which it belonged. This usually got shortened to general acceptance and is the standard for the admissibility of novel scientific testimony in mm -hmm. the states I mentioned mm -hmm. and no doubt others. Uh, then in 1975, the federal rules of evidence were ratified. Rule 702 is about expert witnesses. And essentially what it said in 1975 was provided their testimony is relevant and it isn't otherwise legally excluded, it's admissible. It seemed much more flexible. Um, it took a long time before the question whether Fry had been superseded or not was actually decided. It wasn't decided until 1993 um, in a case called Daubert. It was a, um, a Bendectin case, a morning sickness drug, mm -hmm. alleged to cause birth defect. Uh, by the time it got to the Supreme Court, of course, the issue is purely legal. It's not about the drug. It's not The issue isn't scientific. It's about the law. Uh, and the Supreme Court took this case because it was a very rare civil case in which Fry had been used by the lower courts. Mm -hmm. And the ruling was Fry has been superseded federally. Many states have then followed suit. Uh, but courts still have a responsibility to screen proffered expert testimony, both for, rele for relevance, nothing new there, and for reliability. And with respect to reliability, in the case, the court gave a list of indications you might look to see, look for to see whether or not this probably was decent enough to show to the jury. This happens before the witness comes to the stand? Yes. Makes Ordinarily, story. there will be, okay, there won't be such a hearing unless the testimony is challenged. Uh, but if it is, then ordinarily there would be an in limine hearing, that's to say out of the hearing of the jury, to determine whether or not this person may testify, and if he may, as to what. Uh, this has, I think it would be fair to say that this has turned out to be, perhaps contrary to expectation at the time, a more restrictive rule, at least in civil cases. Mm -hmm. um, the rhetoric of the Supreme Court's ruling suggests it's to be more flexible, but the actual effect seemed to be more restrictive, keeping out more stuff. Uh, of course, it also makes things take longer and cost more, because you, you have to make, mount the challenge and then go through the hearing. So plaintiffs sometimes complain we have to prove this twice. But, but this is becoming increasingly, uh, the, the number of expert witnesses who are mm -hmm. brought into trials, mm -hmm. is, it's, 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 I would assume, increasing over time? It, yes, yes. And it's become a business for a great many oh. people who just advertise their availability. Uh, yes, um, it's become a business for a great many people in another sense also. There are, let me put it this way, there are serious academic scientists um, the chair of our cardiology department would be an example, who are some, have sometimes been called on to be expert witnesses. Um, 
he I know has testified in, in I think it was a Federer cases or maybe it was Fenfen, one of those mm. diet drugs, mm. as to its potential cardiac dangers. But there are also, it's hard to say in what proportion, but there are also not a few expert witnesses who mm. no longer do academic science, uh, perhaps employ more paralegals than they do mm. lab assistants. <laughs> Uh, because this is a potentially lucrative business. It's actually one of the pressures on the integrity of science at the moment. It's you know, the lure of the expert witness business. Mm -hmm. And they're guns for hire. They will come in and give you the testimony that you ask for, or how um, is their lawyer shop them to let um, find somebody? Well, it, I think that's closer to the mm -hmm. truth. Um, I know that my, my colleague, interestingly enough, um, who I believe is not only competent but also honest, mm -hmm. tells me that he has actually served in different instances on both sides, once mm -hmm. for the plaintiffs and mm -hmm. once for the defendants. But as soon as he had done that, people lost interest in hiring him because they, they, they thought he was too potentially too unpredictable. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean. Um, so yes, there's a certain amount of I guess a certain amount of shopping around, but there is also, after all, there's all, all these cases have a history. Everybody knows. It's not hard to find out who the experts were in the previous case involving the same drug or the mm -hmm. same environmental mm -hmm. exposure. Mm -hmm. uh, and so after a while, if you follow the Vendectin cases, for example, or the, the PCB cases or etc., you notice the same names turning up because they get recognized as the go-to guys on this subject. Um, I don't see, okay, I, I do see the phenomenon of um, legal activity sometimes creating a public Im impression that there is scientific disagreement when really there isn't. I don't see it having that effect on the scientific community itself, mm -hmm. uh, but it does, I think, have that effect on public perception. So you have sometimes. these guns for hire who uh, are outliers in terms of what they profess to believe, but who are ready to come forward and uh, defend their side when their side calls upon them. Um, well, there are such people. I mean, I think what, what, act, what you really have, of course, is a continuum of people from entirely honest scientists who happen to know something about this particular topic, who will just come and say what they think, and it happens to be useful to one side in the case. And at the other end, there are the ones who are much more easily swayed. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also I mean, a second idea implicit in your question, which is in some ways more important, I think. And that is that the legal system, in the nature of the problem will call on people who are more certain than the average in their profession that this question is settled. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, usually certainly in, in toxic torts, for example, the case will never come to trial if the science is uniformly regarded as settled. It's only when we're not sure what this, the bad effects of this drug might be, for example, that this litigation happens. If it's certain that it's poison, then the manufacturers will pull it and they will settle with any potential plaintiffs. Well, are you so you're putting you're pulling in people from the margins in a sense. Mm -hmm. And of course it's only human nature. Once you've testified once, you kind of get sure. Mm -hmm. And then when you've testified five times you're perhaps getting really pretty dogmatic or even more certain than you were in the first place. So the perception therefore remains in the general public at least that an issue which scientists are more or less agreed is settled is not settled because you continue to have happens, folks I coming think. forward to kind of defend yes. the position sometimes happens. As, 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 as a professional uh, avocation. No, and sometimes happens, um, probably most often when it happens the outlier turns out to be wrong and will be, look laughable in mm -hmm. 50 years. Mm -hmm. Occasionally the outlier is right. Mm -hmm. right. 
So what does then a, a philosopher of science have to say to uh, the judiciary um, about um, uh, how, how one deals uh, with the need to have properly informative export testimony, but on the other hand, given what human nature is, mm -hmm. the, the proclivity of people in the guise of science uh, simply to make a living uh, mm -hmm. by being on one side? Well, um, there are a lot of things that need looking at, a lot of things that need pulling apart. Um, one thing I spent quite a lot of time on is some of the indicia of reliability that the Supreme Court gave mm -hmm. in Dalbert. Um, take for example, peer review and publication. Um, this is presented in Dalbert in a kind of um, ambiguous way. It's not said unless this work has been subject to peer review and publication. It's not admissible. But it does suggest that this is a good sign that you should be looking for. Okay. Uh, this prompted me to go explore, first of all, what's the history of the pre-publication peer review system? Where did it come from? How old is it? What was its rationale in the first place? How does it work now? Uh, this was actually a revelation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's relatively new. You can find much older anticipations. But when you're talking about you know, um, sending a, a paper submitted to the Royal Society, to some member of the society to look at, this is not peer review in the modern sense. Right, these people are very, very high in their mm -hmm. profession. Mm -hmm. um, in its current form, it dates from after the Second World War. And it came about simply because until then there was no need to ration space in journals. Afterwards, all of a sudden, there was. Okay. If you look at how it works these days, it's, it's, been, it's been fairly thoroughly studied. Um, in scientific journals, it's usual to, send, to do a sort of triage operation first. So, you know, the works of genius, okay, we don't need to send them out. Mm -hmm. um, the, the work of genius is, that's determined on the basis of the genius submitting it, the reputation um, of the author? Who, who knows? Yeah. But, mm -hmm. Editorial triage is common, that's mm -hmm. what I'm telling you. Um, complete gobbledygook we don't send out because it simply wastes everybody's time. And then the vast majority of stuff, of course, falls somewhere in between. Will be sent to one, two, really three people in the field. Um, different policies about who knows who's doing what, but unlike in philosophy, for example, which is supposed to be blind, mm -hmm. um, what I read is that in the sciences often the referee knows whose paper he's mm -hmm. reading, which as you can see opens the door for certain kinds mm -hmm. of corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, the average length of time spent doing this work on a paper, which includes reading it, coming to some conclusion about whether it's publishable, filling out the complicated form that the journal will send you, and if you think it's acceptable with revisions, explaining what revisions you think are necessary, is something of the order of two and a half hours, which isn't very much, to put it mildly. And there's pretty robust evidence of seriously flawed stuff that passes this process. Mm -hmm. And not as much, but still you know, enough to be disturbing evidence of really great stuff which mm -hmm. doesn't survive this process. Um, there's also, of course, as I'm guessing most of your viewers, listeners are aware, mm -hmm. um, at this point the peer review system has become a kind of crutch for university administrators. 
mm-hmm. right? Who who can't or won't look at the quality of somebody's work, and this seems to be. You see what I mean? Uh, and my sense is that legal players probably have an over romantic idea of how effective a quality control mechanism this is. In part because law reviews are not peer reviewed. They're the one academic publication mm-hmm. uh, around in this country today, not peer reviewed. Interestingly enough, they're subject to another mechanism. The, the papers are chosen by the students at the law school that publishes the review, which is strange to put it mildly, um, and of course tends to lead to the acceptance of papers on trendy topics. But put that aside, um, once a paper is accepted, something that happens, something happens at a law review that never so far as I know happens elsewhere, they will check all your footnotes to make sure that it actually says where you say it does what mm-hmm. you say it says. And and in some sense, I think this is a more rigorous process mm-hmm. than the pre public okay. So, okay, I'm, I'm concerned about the effectiveness of this indicium and whether judges understand what its strengths are and what its weaknesses are. And then... It, I, it, does it work very differently in the natural sciences versus the social sciences? Um, formally, no. Mm-hmm. Um, my view for what it's worth is um, not to put too fine a point on it the softer the discipline the more room there is mm-hmm. for um, I wouldn't say subjective considerations but considerations of what kind of approach you favour what kind of names you want to see cited the more role that plays and mm-hmm. the less Mm-hmm. something more objective about the quality mm-hmm. of the work mm-hmm. um, which is why this seems to me in areas like philosophy really a very poor way of deciding what gets published but that's a, a different game altogether okay so I'm, I'm thinking about what first of all what was Justice Blackman thinking what was in his mind when he came up with this indicium and my conjecture is, it has some basis in the text, but not, you know, I couldn't say, this is the only possible way of reading it, but this is a plausible way of reading it. There are actually two different senses of peer review. One is what happens before a paper is published. The other is, once it's published, it's out there. If it's of any interest at all, other people will read it. If it's on a subject which is work is in progress then somebody will get the idea hey maybe I could build on that if this is right then we ought to find that we can do this and if it turns out to be mistaken then in that process eventually the mistake will get discovered Mm -hmm. call that pre-publication peer review and scientific scrutiny after publication Okay, now here's the problem as I see it, qua philosopher. It's very easy for a judge to determine whether or not the paper was peer-reviewed before it was published. That's not a hard question. It doesn't require any kind of scientific expertise. It just requires asking the right questions. So uh, not all judges know what the right questions are. Some judges think, I believe, If the paper is published in a peer review journal, then it's peer reviewed. But the way to cure that is simply to tell them, no, this is not true. Some of those things would have been invited. Some of them will be symposia paper where the publication was paid for by the outfit that we use. The other thing is, would this work survive the long run scrutiny of the scientific community after publication? Well, there's no way for a judge to know that. The scientists concerned don't know this. No one can know this until they've actually done the work. Mm -hmm. And so what you've got is something which is a really good indication of reliability, but which courts have no way to identify reliably, and something which they can identify with just a little bit of noose, but which is a very weak indication of reliability. 
so that Justice Blackman came up with something that looks more helpful than it really is. So there are citation indexes that you can yes. go to, yes. which will show you if there's been enough time since publication, uh, how much interest has mm -hmm. been shown in the work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, would, would that be a better standard to which to repair and, and do... No, not necessarily, do, yeah. no, because it might be cited because it's so horrible. <laughs> this is the awful example of what happens if you don't control for this very say. Or it might be cited often because it's by the big man in the field. So what is a judge to do? Okay, but you, but you understand this is... Part of my job is to say to judges, look, um, it may not have occurred to you, but this in, indicium, as they call it, is ambiguous. And it's ambiguous between something which is easily applied but not terribly helpful mm -hmm. and something which is would be extremely helpful but which n nobody would think that you or indeed anyone could really effectively apply. So that you're obliged to fall back on good judgment. Uh, and if you just hold on to this as a crutch, it's going to make matters worse rather than mm -hmm. better. And of course there's a whole list of indicators um, this isn't the only one that's ambiguous in that way. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, what the Supreme Court did in Dalbert was set the new standard for admissibility of expert testimony. But it didn't decide the case. It sent the case back down to the Ninth Circuit. And it shows up in Judge Kaczynski's courtroom he decides not to tend it back down to the trial court. The argument being, look, if we at the appeals level determine this case, then there's going to be more consistency than if we send it down to a trial <coughs> court. Okay. Because we've set some principles that trial courts can look to. Fair enough. And he comes up with his own new so-called Dalbert factor. Is the science litigation driven? Was it conducted for the purpose of litigation? Or was it conducted rather, you know, quite independently of this litigation, and now the law, legal system is qualified? Mm -hmm. Which sounds kind of plausible when you first hear it. <coughs> uh, indeed, I think it, it's true that on average, the stuff which is produced purely for the purposes of litigation is probably less good than the stuff that's purely academic. The problem is, of course, that the same is true of, for example, research undertaken by a drug manufacturer for marketing purposes. But they, they also have an incentive to look for the good side, of the good effects, and not for the bad side effects. So that this doesn't do as much. This is not as as clean an indicator mm -hmm. as you might have thought. Um, okay. Well, there's also all sorts of. Okay, the, that was only the first in a long, you know, a long series of cases, but in three cases. Uh, they called the Dalbert trilogy. It goes: Dalbert, Joiner, Kumho, Tyre. Dalbert sets the new standard. Joyner determines that the standard of appellate review of decisions about whether or not to admit expert testimony is abuse of discretion. Still with me? Mm -hmm. Which means, first of all, you've shifted some of the burden for deciding the worth of expert testimony from the jury to the judge who's now looking at its content and determine whether he thinks it's reliable enough for them to hear. His decision is reviewable only for abuse of discretion. The appeals court won't look again at the evidence and decide what it would have done. And Kumho Tyre, which is not about scientific testimony, but about expert testimony, says this ruling applies to all expert testimony including the guy who comes along and looks at the tire and says, nah, that's bad design, that's not abuse, mm -hmm. that caused this blowout. Uh, by the time you get to Kumho, the court's realizing, oh, oh um, the indicator of reliability we gave in Dalbert 
were focused on the idea the evidence was science. This isn't science. This is something else. This is expertise, but it's not scientific expertise. Um, and so what that court says is, you know, it's not whether it's scientific knowledge that matters, it's whether it's knowledge, scientific or otherwise, that this person has. And this means that you may use the Dalbert factors if they seem appropriate, but if they seem inappropriate, you can ignore them. And if you can think of something more appropriate, well, you can use that. And now you see that they've reached the conclusion that I was also reaching, that there is no escaping. The judge has to use his judgment. <laughs> well, um, if that's the case, mm -hmm. uh, does the legal training of judges either, well, so, uh, I, I don't suppose this would be terribly true in most law schools, but uh, perhaps after they've arrived on the <laughs> bench, uh, does the continuing professional training of judges uh, now encompass uh, the kinds of... Uh, information uh, okay, that they will yes. need to be wise judges of these uh, matters. This is a very difficult issue. Um, I don't know what the proportion is, but in my experience, at least, in a law school, which is probably fairly typical, at least in this respect, uh, a minority of my students have some sort of scientific background, mm -hmm. but it's a relatively small minority. It's much commoner for them to have a degree in, say, history or political theory or maybe literature or religion, anything. Um, a few come from biology, for example, but it's relatively unusual. Uh, a few come from criminology, that's, which tells them something about mm -hmm. forensic science at least. That's law students. Okay. By the time they've finished law school, um, unless they've taken a class like mine, they haven't had much encounter with the sciences at all. Uh, by the time if they become a judge, they become a judge. They've been involved in the legal system for probably decades. And even if they were science graduates in the first instance, the knowledge that they acquired then is probably out of date. Mm. Uh, so this is a serious question. Uh, I've talked to some federal judges about it, and one of the things that, one of the shrewdest things, I think, I got in response was, we don't know much about science, but we're pretty, we, you learn when you're being snowed. Uh, and I think that's, probably true, that they are quite true at that level. The problem is, of course, that whether or not an expert can be relied on depends on two things. One is whether he's telling the truth as he believes it to be, and the other is whether he's competent to know how what the truth is in this matter. And I think, in general, legal players are better at the first question than the second. Uh, there have been efforts to educate judges scientifically. Um, some of them I think more successful than others. Um, I read a news report, for example, about a, a weekend seminar on DNA, mm -hmm. where they actually got to play with the stuff. Mm -hmm. Gee willigers! Mm -hmm. um, that kind of worries me, because you really can't understand this stuff in a weekend. I mean, it's like trying to make me into a concert pianist over a weekend. It just it can't be done. You, you, you need such a lot of background simply to understand the terminology that I suspect that you know, the kind of thing you can teach them is likely to be superficial and potentially misleading. Some of it, I think, has been more successful. Um, one of the things that I'm kind of keen on is that judges know at least the elements of probability theory, so they have some idea about what the numbers they're being given by, say, a DNA expert or an epidemiologist might mean. That they learn what, what a scientist means by statistical significance, for example, and why they set the level mm -hmm. where they do. 
that kind of thing. And this is not beyond the realms of practicality. This is any intelligent person mm. could get a grip on this in a reasonably short time. And there's also, I think, some tendency for judges who have experience in a certain sort of case, which typically brings in a certain sort of evidence. Um, don't know, you could look at this two ways, but if you do this a number of times, you kind of get the hang of it. Now, you may say that's a bit rough on the first plaintiff who shows up when they're yeah. beginning to learn, but I think they do learn. For example, um, a few years ago there were several quite well-known vaccine cases. You, know, you remember there was a scare about MMR vaccine and autism. There are special vaccine laws and special vaccine courts, and the vaccine court took three test cases, um, in all of which it decided that you know, they were very, very sorry for the poor child, but the evidence that the vaccine had caused the problem was just not there. And I noticed reading one of those cases in particular, you know, a judge who seemed to me to be handling the scientific stuff well, um, asking the right questions about the way the study was, the studies were conducted, for example. Um, and I was sufficiently curious to go look her up and discovered that she'd previously been the judge in a series of big environmental mm -hmm. toxic court cases and drew the conclusion yeah, that she's, she's had a lot of experience of this kind of thing. She's beginning, I don't, I don't know how, maybe she was great at, in the first case, I don't know, but by the time of this vaccine case, I was really quite impressed by the judicial handling of this. So, so in the Western world, litigation is increasingly informed by scientific judgment. Um, but from what you're telling me, it sounds like uh, the responses thus far, at least in the United States, I don't know what's true in Europe and elsewhere, but the responses have been kind of ad hoc, uh, yes. rather than any effort to kind of institutionalize some way of handling this. Well, okay, it's an ad hoc way of institutionalizing a way of handling so, this. Sort of like the evolution of common law, we're going to grope yes. our way towards some That's standard That's right, practice. exactly so, yes. Um, you said there was a special vaccine court, did that mean that they had chosen a judge or a set of judges because of their putative knowledge of uh, the science in um, They were special masters, so-called, which means, yes, they can have been, in part, selected for their history. Um, you know, the, the vaccine law and vaccine court business is itself an example of, of the ad hocus pocus of the common mm -hmm. law system. Mm -hmm. um, in the first instance, um, it began with the, the swine flu epidemic mm. in 1976, mm -hmm. where after vaccination, the swine flu epidemic, big panic, big government program of vaccination. And after vaccination, there was a very significant rise in Guillaume-Barre syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first special law about vaccine in the wake of this says, look, you don't sue the doctor who gave you the injection. You don't sue the clinic or the hospital you went to. You don't sue the manufacturer. You sue the government. It was our idea everybody get vaccinated. <laughs> so you, you should sue the government. And then after the scare about pertussis, whooping cough vaccination, special vaccine courts when these cases are heard, and but in some ways, I think this might be an alternate model for toxic torts more generally. Mm. You know, a list of these are the known side effects of these vaccines. And maybe I can back up a bit. Look, enormous, clear public health benefit to having enough people vaccinated against these diseases. Right? Um, you need something like 80% of the population mm. vaccinated and you can more or less get rid of the disease. Falls below that, you're in trouble. But vaccines do have side effects, and some of these are well known, and some, well, I'm thinking children, some children will be damaged. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have a list of these are the known bad effects, if 
your child is vaccinated and develops one of those, then you'll be compensated from a fund pro provided by the manufacturers. This actually saves a lot of time, energy, money, agony. You don't so go to the court at all. You don't have to go to court at all. You only have to go to court if you're claiming something that's mm -hmm. not on the list. Mm -hmm. okay. This is actually kind of an interesting alternate way of handling a certain mm -hmm. sort of problem, mm -hmm. uh, which grew up in the wake of particular problems, but seems to me to have some merits. Um, a student a couple of years ago wrote me a paper about how, why don't we just make the whole toxic talk system like this? And um, that can be argued. It's not necessarily a bad model. So do you see the judicial system evolving in a good direction with respect to uh, these matters? I see it, okay, I see it fumbling. Um, in, in a way which is almost always, I think, well-intentioned, um, not always terribly acute, I don't know how to put this quite, but sometimes more successful mm -hmm. than others. Um, for instance, you might have expected that after Dalbert, which as I said, was presented as if it was relaxing the standards, but in fact, I think, if anything, tighten them. You might think this could be extremely healthy for the criminal justice system because among the weakest science presented in the courtroom is some of the forensic stuff. You know, the bite marks, and the mm -hmm. hair analysis. And we, we, we actually have good reason to think these are quite unreliable. Mm -hmm. Knife marks, a long-running Florida case that turned on knife mark identification, for example. And you only have to read the guy's, the expert's testimony <coughs> for the word voodoo to come to your mind. <laughs> uh, it wouldn't matter if there were a million knives of the same design. I could identify this one to the exclusion of all other knives in the world. <laughs> And, you know, I'm rolling my eyes and saying, <laughs> give me a break. Um, how do you know this? Can I go to Home Depot and buy a case and you will tell me which of them made this mark? <laughs> uh, that didn't happen. Not, any time, no, not right away at all. Um, in fact, Dalbert had almost no effect on criminal cases for quite a long time. Um, for instance... Fingerprint identification is, it's, it's not so much that there's nothing in it, as that we really don't have good information about exactly how reliable an identification made of a partial print of one finger mm -hmm. is. Right? It's not that, I'm not saying the whole thing is a fraud, I'm only saying a latent fingerprint is usually only about 20% of a full finger. Right? So it's nothing like a full 10 print card. And yet fingerprint examiners tend to be very dogmatic. They're 100% sure. Right? And this is kind of disturbing. Um, I suspect that we might see um, some movement on this sort of issue coming from outside the legal system um, with that um, National Academies of Science booklet, book from 2009. Do you know this book? It's called Strengthening Forensic Science in mm -hmm. the United States. Mm -hmm. And it looks at the various forensic specialties and suggests, you know, these are ways in which we could beef up mm -hmm. the validity of this kind of work. These are the ways in which we might make the fingerprint examiners more like the DNA examiners, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. um, and because this is exactly the kind of thing that a defense attorney challenging potentially iffy forensic testimony can bring to court and say, look, the NAS says this is how they do the fingerprint thing. Look, um, I remember bringing it to my class a few weeks ago um, because a student had asked a really good question. 
No, law students ask really good questions sometimes. And this young man just said, you know, we, we keep seeing on television this fingerprint matching computer software. Right? And you see the thing from the crime scene on one screen and millions and millions and millions of fingerprints, boom, match. Okay. How does it work, this software? And I say, yeah, I don't know. Um, I know it doesn't actually kick up one match. It usually kicks up many, um, maybe 10, maybe 20, sometimes as many as 40. That's the first thing. So if you're relying on CSI, this is, <laughs> it's not like that. And I also know that uh, when I stopped the video, I actually taped an issue of, of an episode of CSI because I was curious about mm -hmm. this. I could see that they had points marked on the one that they were looking for a match to. And as it went by too fast, I couldn't count them. Um, so I finally managed to stop the video and count the number of points that they had mm -hmm. identified. It was only six, which is a very mm -hmm. small number. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how the software works. I'll try to find out. And I come back the next week, and I found out. It's in the NAS book, actually. They tell you how it works. Um, this is actually really surprising, at least to me. The fingerprint examiner has to identify the features it wants the computer program to look for before he puts it in. Mm -hmm. So that there's an element of, of subjective mm -hmm. discretion mm -hmm. involved before the computer gets started. But moreover, there are several programs not mutually operable. So you, you have to learn how if you're using this bit of software, you need to identify this kind of feature. But if you're using that kind of software, this is much, much more complex, mm -hmm. much, uh, involves much more uh, human input than I had previously known. And, and you know, I'm, if I'm a defense attorney, I'm going to come to court and say, look, you know, it's in this very um, authoritative volume, when the volume is being quoted in court all the time, as far as I can tell. That might change things, and it might change things for the better. So, uh, in, in your own work, mm -hmm. uh, as a philosopher of mm -hmm. science who's mm -hmm. interested in mm -hmm. the reliability of mm -hmm. science and the way in which the law assimilates science, um, have you found uh, that you, you have an attentive audience in the uh, juridical community? Um, I've been surprised, hmm. yes. Uh, I'm not, and it's not in Tokay, okay, this is, this is actually quite complex. Um, in this country, of course, law schools are professional schools, they're not um, academic departments in the sense in which a philosophy department is, or a history department. Uh, but there are plenty of people who specialize in this kind of thing. Um, with now any number of whom I have you know, interesting interactions. Uh, in Europe and in Latin America, a law school is an academic department. Um, it will have an undergraduate degree and a PhD program, and and in those circumstances, there's you know, there's, there's there's an audience for the more academic end of my thinking about this, um, an eager and, and happy audience. Well, Colombia, for example, has adopted something Dalbert-like, so mm -hmm. they're really interested in in how it's working out in this country. Um, in their case, and only in criminal cases, but that's another story. Uh, and I can remember, I remember two occasions where I was just delighted by judges' reactions, and I sometimes present in forum where there are judges about. Um, one instance. Well, my paper was quite academic, 
Um, one of the things the Supreme Court does in Dalbert is it gets hold of Karl Popper. Oh Lord. Um, Popper's philosophy of science, in my opinion, is just completely broken backed. Mm -hmm. it, it's terrible. Um, if, everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. Uh, it's a nightmare sorting it out. There's, there's the official popper and then there's the unofficial popper who backs away from all the, mm -hmm. the bold things that the official popper said. It's, it's like Kierkegaard says, these, these important thinkers build this great castle and then they go and live in a shack nearby because the castle's uninhabitable. Well, popper's like that. And Justice Blackman gets popper completely confused with Karl Hempel, who is a whole different mm -hmm. kind of philosopher of science. And in one paper I wrote, I guess it's now close to a decade ago, I was simply explaining, look, these, this is what Popper says, and this is what Hempel says. And you can see why Justice Blackman would like to take something from one and something from the other, but the problem is they're just incompatible. It can't be done. And a federal judge at one occasion where I presented this said, hey, that, okay, that explains a lot. And then I discovered that uh, she writes the introduction to the Federal Reference Manual on Scientific Testimony. Mm -hmm. So she, she was definitely no slouch in this area. And then on another occasion with the same, it was actually the same organizers of a, a, a regular conference, I spoke at some length about tensions between uh, the nature of science and the culture of US law. I think they're very different and these tensions explain some of the reasons that the law doesn't get the best out of science that it might. And there there was, among other people, someone I, I didn't know at all sitting in the audience reasonably quiet, um, looking quite confident, but didn't say a lot. And when I was finished, she winked at me and she went like this. <laughs> Who's that? Well, she was the Supreme, Cus Supreme Court Chief Justice in, I won't say which state. I don't want to embarrass her potentially, but I was just stunned. Yay, okay. Um, so, she recognizes what I'm trying to say, that something is going on, which is a kind of, of clash of cultures, which has to be resolved adequately. It doesn't have to be resolved perfectly, and which we have more chance of resolving if we recognize. Mm -hmm. If you don't see where this problem is coming from, it's harder to adapt so as to fix it. And that was my thinking anyway, and apparently at least one Chief Justice agreed with me, which was very gratifying. So you're trying to sort of disabuse uh, our jurists of uh, a kind of um, innocent deferential attitude um, towards science? I'm, yes, I'm trying to disabuse them both. Okay, there are both, both ends of the spectrum are represented, I think, in the judicial community. Um, there are some, no doubt, who are overly deferential towards, you know, probably fewer judges than jurors overly deferential towards science. That's my guess. And there are also, of course, some who are perhaps unduly cynical. Mm -hmm. um, and you can imagine how sitting in the courtroom noticing that you can print somehow or other both sides always manage to produce experts with impeccable credentials. This could make you kind of cynical, couldn't it? And so I think that happens too. Um, the judge, if he sees this too often, can think, you know, maybe there's nothing objective out there to be found. When I think the truth is, the issue is in court in part because we don't know the answer yet. Mm -hmm. so well, one, of the, one of the cultural differences is simply the timetable. Hmm? Science takes the time it takes. Sometimes a question gets solved quickly. Sometimes it takes forever and then when you've solved it, there are a hundred other questions and they fall like dominoes because you've got mm -hmm. the theoretical backing. Now you know what to do. 
but it takes the time it takes. But the legal system has a legitimate interest in we want a prompt decision, and before too long we'd like a final decision. And this means that you're calling on the sciences to give answers when they're not ready. That's, that's one of the important tensions, I think, the difference in schedule. Um, and it's one that has to be, it has to be stressed um, by me, when I'm, especially when I'm talking in civil law systems, because this is not peculiar to the US legal culture. This is a feature of every legal system of, of, of any decency. Uh, and it means every legal system will have that kind of tension with the science that it's calling on. Well, we often think of philosophy as being hyper abstract, of airily spinning its mm -hmm. wheels. It's it's wonderful to see <laughs> that there's a philosophy that so usefully engages uh, with the real world. Well, thank you, Dr. Hawk. Well, thank it's you. It's been a pleasure to have you. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we will um, begin uh, Institute Encounters again uh, next semester. So, have a nice summer.